John Powell, and we're going to talk about musical things, maybe, uh, film things, maybe, business things, maybe, industry things, and um, I don't know, dogs as well. <laughs> Well, John, thank you so much for your time, and I know you're really busy. And thank you for inviting me back here to talk. It's been so it's a real pleasure to be here. So pleasure. Um, so to start, I guess let's rewind to the beginning. Um, maybe what made you want to get in this profession in the first place? Going all the way back to your young, hip, energetic self. What made you really want to jump into this path? Um, I only really ever wanted to get into music. Right. Um, seven years old, went to a rehearsal of Bra uh, Mendelssohn Violin Concerto, and was transfixed by it. Couldn't think of anything else all night, and uh, so I took up the violin and, uh, you know, loved making music. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a few years later, I, I remember sitting in a youth orchestra, um, age ten or something, I think, uh, playing. Hello. Oh, <laughs> uh, playing the um, bits of um, the um, Fiber Stravinsky, mm -hmm. second violins, back of the second violins, you know, and it just twisted my head off. Right. Know? So from there onwards, I just thought I do find that music is capable of expressing things that I cannot even begin to find the words for. Right. So the transcendence of music was it was like a religion for me. I, believe it's the only real worthy religion you know, everything else I, I'm an atheist so I'm I think an atheist too, so. the rest of them are all <laughs> bullshit for me because uh, I grew up falling in love with not just your music you Hans and Harry were kind of the trifecta that kind of got me and I'm not a musician like I got, fell into it went to film school I got into film because of film music but for me it was the only thing that made sense growing up it was the only thing that you could piece together and for me I don't know just exploring the human condition that way I got more of a emotional reawakening or something from film and film music than you know politics or all that stuff that's kind of going on in the world and and so I don't know that's just kind of connected with me that way so it's kind of cool to but not classical music she didn't not at first because mm. when I growing up I was the first I remember the first R-rated movie my mom ever let me watch I was nine it was a uh, 90 it was Six, it was The Rock, and that was right. <laughs> that was Hans, Nick, and Harry, and and then Face Off also. But I didn't know that you guys were kind of working together all under the same roof at the time. And uh, I remember my dad's uh, friend at, in DC he had a record store, and he would bring home the samples and the, the promos that they would get. And I'm like, I like this and this and this, and so I kind of pieced it together that way. And as I got older, I'm like, hey, these guys kind of work together. So, <laughs> well, I mean, the thing is that. If film music is a good sort of feeder for um, you know other kinds of music, uh, I I'm always happy with that. But you know I, I'm always and people know that I'm I'm quite you know not dismissive of film music, but right. because there's some some of the great music of all time has been written for film. You right. Know, I mean whether it's by you know Benjamin Britten or William Walton or Shostakovich. I mean yeah. you know, he wrote some, Prokofiev wrote some fantastic stuff for film. Uh, Saint Saëns wrote the first orchestral score ever for a film. Um, so there's, you know, I, I'm a big fan of Peter Gabriel Four. So when I saw, um, you know, uh, when I saw Last, Last Temptation of Christ, you right. know, the music for that, I mean, that's basically been the, sort of the model for everything that comes out of uh, anywhere near the Middle East right. uh, for all music <laughs> now. but. Um, before that, it didn't, you know, it, it didn't sound like that. Uh, so, you know, then there's lots of, lots of other kind of crossover pop, you know, rock, yeah, yeah, hip hop stuff that's been really interesting and, and classical, of course, obviously. Um, so I'm interested in any music that, that, touches me. But the stuff that was connected with film was probably more like, um, you know, I remember watching, uh, you know. The Magnificent Seven, yeah, you know, <laughs> and the uh, Great Escape. So you know, just they 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 interested me probably because they had the uh, such wonderfully rigorous compositional standards. Yeah, 
his um, work kind of influenced you a little bit too, Elmer's work. Oh yeah, yeah. hugely. But also, yeah. but then you can also say Copeland, really. Right. So and you know and so and Irish Scottish folk tunes were you know feed into that. So right, right. it's all sort of connected in a way. The 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 question of putting music to film is is twofold. One, but mainly it was an economic decision. I mean, I, that's why I did it because I was writing music and when I came out of college and trying to figure out what to do with a four year study of composition, there's right. not much you can really to earn money. And uh, my friend Gavin Greenaway, you know, was working with a jingle company called Aerodel in London. And so started to work for them. And, and that interested me because every day, you know, you know, you had a different style of music they asked you to write. Right. So I, I liked being eclectic for that. But after a while it gets a bit dull because it's only 30 seconds. And <laughs> You know, and they keep asking you to make it chocolatey. Right. Uh, and then after that, you know, what gets interesting is when you start to have more ability to be able to kind of mess with expectations right. uh, and emotions and things. So, you know, coming to Hollywood, I guess, was a, a natural way of continuing kind of a, what seemed like a good, you know, business uh, ideal, but right. I did enjoy. I do enjoy it. I, you know, I have always enjoyed it. But I'm really always just trying to write music, really. And if right. they let me fit it to their film, all the better. So. <laughs> so I mean, you came to Hollywood and you started working. You're kind of that first wave of uh, composers. It was Media Ventures at the time with Hans and you and a few other people. I thought I always thought I was about the third wave of the third wave. Mia, but I mean, you know, I guess okay. I'm young enough. <laughs> so I mean, what was the atmosphere like there? Was it like was it a camaraderie was it competitive i mean were you 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 kind of had a little niche with harry and you guys co-composed some stuff together yes but no i mean that was the great thing was that it was both really i mean you're you know there's 10 12 14 sort of kids all right. all trying to get attention from daddy which is hands you know <laughs> so you end up trying to either impress him uh -huh. or or you know, or just write better than the other guy, you know. Yeah. So Harry and I really were set against each other to to try and, you know, and I'd go into his room and hear a cue and it'd be like, oh, shit. And I'd go <laughs> back to my place and I'd realise I'd have to up my game, you know. Right. You can't not, you know, you, you can't not work that way because, you know, when somebody's good and they work and you and there's a lot at stake, you know, and you next morning you've got a meeting with Jeffrey Katzenberg and... <laughs> And and you want to play something that's really good, and you hear the other guys written something really good, you're going to try harder. So, it's a good way of you know of increasing the you know the competitiveness is is very effective, I think. But there's also a lot of camaraderie. There's not many places in the world you could kind of wander out of your room at four a.m. and find somebody else who understood exactly the pain you were going through. Right. <laughs> um, and you could sit around and you know drink coffee and. Well, Harry would be smoking, but you know, <laughs> Hans would be smoking, but I wouldn't. But um, you know, so you, you know, you'd, you'd have people that you can kind of talk to and, right. and you know, kind of relate to. So you're what not you're just doing. trapped with your thoughts yeah. in a room for God knows how long. Well, and, and composition is, you know, a it's a lonesome sport. It's yeah. uh, you know, it's not a place where you normally hang, hang out with other people, which is ironic because I really only got into composing because I wasn't a good enough player. Right. I realised if I wanted to keep making music. Playing wasn't doing it for me. I mean, I clearly was not up to it, really. Right. I realized, you know, you have friends and you see the standard of, you know, playing required just to start to get anywhere. So with all that going on, I, I thought, well, maybe I could organize it. And then I thought, well, maybe I should write some things, you know. <laughs> um, and it kept me in the game, as it were. Right. So, I mean, when you start writing for films, uh, for stories, and you're, you're essentially a storyteller... Um, would you say that you are a better composer now than you were when you were younger? Do you ha do you think that life experience, pain, sadness, happiness, joy, going through all that makes you a better storyteller because you know how to, I guess, speak that language in music musical terms? Or, I, I mean, really, I, I'd say, I, I, worked almost entirely on instinct mm -hmm. um, because I didn't really have the right training. I mean, people ask me what's a how do you get into film music? I say go to drama school, mm -hmm. study theatre, right? Or go to film school, study film, right? You know, 
then we should assume that you you can compose. But after that, but but uh, learning the language of film, learning the language of storytelling would be would have been much more useful. So I did just did it in on instinct, mm. um, and I guess I must have had some good instincts. And it wasn't really until I started working with George Miller that I started to realize how much I didn't know about storytelling and. And so working with him was incredibly useful. He he was very open about his process, and that allows you to kind of get a, a view into um, the complexities of, of what a director is thinking right. and why and what they're trying to do and the whole purpose of storytelling and what is cinema. Mm-hmm. So uh, group therapy, really. <laughs> so in, a, in an essence, musical composition is a craft, just like any other aspect of the filmmaking process, but um, is uh, is it always a joyful creative experience, or is it, and not just the craft itself, not working with people, not the deadlines and everything, but is it always joyful, or can it be uh, psychologically stressful and painful at times? I mean, do you? I mean, is it kind of hard on the psyche sometimes to be focused that more, whether it's an emotional thing, whether you're focused on a scene, whether it's just the amount of work? Like, is it taxing, or is it always kind of rewardingly creative? I I don't know. I mean it's, it's I find it hard mm-hmm. but I think I'm you know I I, I now think of myself I realized myself as a as a disabled composer. <laughs> um I don't think I would have done very well were it not for the fact that I've got computers. I mean I would have figured something out but it would have been with tape machines, you know, and if it was before tape machines I probably would have been fucked. Um I just don't have the in intellectual capacity to kind of figure it out well enough on paper. You know, I mean, I think, yeah, because I can only really hear a couple of seconds of music <laughs> sort of ahead of mm-hmm. where I am. So I, I work in a kind of a weird cycle of trying moving forward two seconds at a time. Mm. Uh, but I have to roll back and sort of listen all the time. So, and I just listen, I get to the end of an idea and I, you know, and I see if I can hear the next two seconds. Mm-hmm. So, so the process for me is very tough. Um, but the enjoyment is obviously when you see it come together. Right. I mean, you know, you sort of see something start to form, and and then, I mean, a lot of it's editing as well. I mean, yeah, I, yeah. I, I'm a very bad piano player, so I, I basically stick any kind of <laughs> fistfuls of notes in, and and if it seems to be the right rhythm or the right language. Um, or the right sort of idea, it can be complete bollocks at that point, mm-hmm. and I just go in and I very slowly kind of remove lots of notes from the chords and experiment in a kind of an, in an editing environment and and create things like that. Some things obviously just come straight out. You right. know. Yeah. I mean, you know, a lot of film music people don't realise is that people just improvise it. Mm-hmm. That's <laughs> how it was written, and you know, there's not a lot of compositional rigour. Right. in film music sometimes there is and you can look at it all sorts of different ways theme and variations you know um, you know at the very least arch form yeah. sometimes you know sonata form some people can fit that into their cues but generally you're following picture so you right. you, you tend to sort of just go with whatever <laughs> seems to fit and depending on the abilities of the composer, you know, you can get more or less sophisticated music. Right. Um, somebody like Jerry Goldsmith, who had a, such a great intellect and could write like Ravel, you know, he could he could take a scene and and he was finding the the heart of the character, but yeah. he was also able to improvise in the style of Ravel. So, right. or write in the style of Ravel, you know, depending on how you do it, whether you on paper or whether you're just going to a computer I mean if it a lot of the times it really is just jammed I mean you know and then you take bits and you piece it together so um, it's very different I mean you know John Williams is different from Everyone from the rest it. of the yeah. yeah I mean just not many people who work like that probably and that may be one of the reasons film music has got a bit of shit is that it's kind of very easy you can, everybody's disabled now I guess if so you can use a computer um, but I always thought it was worth. I, I put a pressure on myself. I don't know how other people maybe do or don't. I don't know how they do it sometimes. But I put a pressure on myself to actually make a value of the chance that mm-hmm. I have. If I have this chance, 
don't just write the first thing that comes to your brain and you know and be done with it right sometimes you don't have time to do anything else but uh, if you have time and if you have the inclination look again it was what well, is this as good as it could be maybe I could try something else so I yeah. go through lots of ideas sometimes do, does the I know uh, Hans likes to sometimes if he works with Chris Nolan or uh, you know somebody he's worked with before if he has the opportunity to write suites or write yeah. some stuff before they even start shooting do you ever write before picture happens or do you wait for a locked rough cut or no I mean you know the sweet idea is is great and it's a it's a you know it's a way of kind of being able to get tone a tone of music mm-hmm. and a and a kind of a bulk of material that you can then start to you know utilize um and depending on the kind of film I mean, the chris nolan thing with hands is there's nobody else has the, that kind of relationship i don't think you know i right. mean it's it's very rare everybody wishes <laughs> everybody wishes they could work with somebody like chris nolan because you know he ta- you write music, he takes the music, and he kind of almost makes the film round. It's fantastic. Yeah. Know, who wouldn't like that? But, you know, obviously that has happened with other composers and films. Obviously, Morricone did that with, Mariani. you know. Yeah. And there's plenty of people who do do it. I mean, the Johnny, <laughs> you know, some of the Johnny Greenwood stuff is written, oh, right. you know, beforehand. And I have done it. Um, and I, I found there's advantages and disadvantages both ways. It depends on who it is what kind of film right. the tone sometimes you just look at the film and you just know what you need to do mm-hmm. it's really easy but the hard thing is they're messing with the film so i love sometimes to wait to the last minute and i did enjoy pan because they were you know it was kind of they weren't changing it too much <laughs> well they were but you know they pretty much let me kind of go on a direction and i and i, and I went that direction and it all st- struck me as making sense and i think that hopefully to them it made sense as well but it was you know a very specific kind of tone other films you know I've done are hard to find the tone I mean you know Born Identity didn't have a tone you know trying to get the right music for that which was basically as long as it didn't sound like anything that you know the director had heard before then that's right. what he wanted and that's right. a kind of a weird and wide brief so how do you find something that doesn't exist and doesn't damage the film actually mm-hmm. helps the film finds the the right way to work with the film you know as soon as you do anything slightly different from the norm it, it kind of throws lots of wrenches into the works you right. know the sound effects guys are like tearing their hair out because you know they know is best they know the best thing to cut through sound effects is a, a tune on strings and then a, some long notes you know and a, a hi-hat and that's but it also, it also goes both ways too, because I one of, I think one of the greatest action scores is ever composed recently is Born Ultimatum. I really love it, and it's mixed so low in the film, at least for me, at least from my point of view. Like Tangiers, that's that sequence. Mm. It's an amazing track, but you know when you watch the film, it's you have to over everything. Yeah. Like, did you have to? Do you have to be there and fight for it, or do you talk to them like I think it should be up more? The director kind of says no, it should be underneath a little bit more. Uh, you know, I, years ago, I, I used to sort of hang out in the in the dub stage and, mm-hmm. and fight for things and, until I realised that that was a terrible idea. <laughs> um, Born Identity, I went to the dub and and uh, and we did a lot of recutting and mm-hmm. actually at the dub and and we worked very well together. You know, that was Scott Milan, who's a fantastic dubbing right. mixer, and, and I remember you know just that was also where we um, remember sitting there with Doug Lyman when he said to Scott uh, I think it was he said to Scott well we we're reading he said uh, if this film does over a hundred million I will I'll put uh, some kind of very unpleasant um, what's the stuff you put on a on a s- sore back or something like oh, that, um, that stings you know oh the the icy hot Something like that. It was yeah. some other kind of thing. He he basically said that if this film did over a hundred million, he'd stick it on his up his balls, <laughs> and um, and and literally six weeks later, we we came back and and I, I got to watch Doug Lyman take a giant load of this kind of very uh, pleasant stuff and burn his balls off virtually, and he had to rush to the toilet and they had a bucket of ice for him and so that was a good dub I liked that dub and it and it worked well, well you know, sounds like a good director too yes that's great that's great you know I mean so but ultimatum obviously came from 
it was built on number one and number two, right. and it was built, you know, by Paul and Chris Frouse, the editor, and they used a lot of the score from the first movies, and I wrote plenty of new stuff, but, you know, some of it <laughs> didn't feel enough like the old stuff, so, you know, Paul <laughs> decided at the last minute to not use it. And, and you know, and that's when I learned a very important lesson, which is what is good for the film is good for me. Mm-hmm. You know, not fighting for things that, you know, are about my ego. Right. They're, you know, fight for things that are for the film. Right. And if, so if I worked hard on that score, and I did, I tried to do as but well, but ultimately it was better to kind of be much more kind of re- reminiscent of the second film, the first film, mm-hmm. then that was fine. If, if that, if that was what, you know, people who are very smart people, <laughs> you know, <laughs> are watching the film, creating the film and they really want to just relax into the genre that we've already created in the first two films as it were why not do that right. so rather than you know kicking up a fuss it was better to just kind of go with it um, and maybe if I'd gone to the dub and got them to play it louder the film wouldn't have been as successful because the music yeah. would have been banging at you rather than just kind of creating a nice grease under the wheels mm-hmm. I mean there's a lot of things about filmmaking that you you know, you have to sort of see it in perspective of it's a collaboration. Right. So I can do what I can do, but being a dick about, you know, my <laughs> role in it is not necessarily a very good idea. It may not be good for the film and it may not be good for me. So we're talking about ego and also disabled composers with technology and everything. And um, I guess this maybe would maybe affect people coming into this industry. You know, a lot of people move here, they're seeking a career in this. Right now it's so freaking tough because everyone has, you can go outside with an iPhone and you can make things and everything. Everybody can do everything. So when you came to Hollywood, did you have to mold your, you have, you're, I think, a great auteur. You have a very distinct sound, you have a style, and you fit it into the films that you work on. Work on. But when you first came here, did you have to mold your sound to what Hollywood wanted, or were you adamant going this is my voice this is what i sound like and hear me roar you know this is what i am well well working with hands was was you know was interesting because i couldn't i couldn't see anybody who was more successful around me mm-hmm. and and yet there were things about what he did that i liked and things that about what he did that i didn't like mm-hmm. but that's just my taste so I was just trying to figure out what was pragmatic. Um, you know, so Face Off, I was hired not because they knew me or they liked my music, but because Hans mm-hmm. said, I can't do this film, but this kid might be able to do it. So when you're in that position, you're not going to, you're not going to stand there and go, I know you want Hans Zimmer, but you know, I'm going to give you something completely different that you've never heard before. That's just going to be amazing. <laughs> I mean, you could say it, but I almost guarantee that, if you give it to them, they're going to be like, well, we did want hands, and the hands mm-hmm. said you could do it, and the implication is perhaps that <laughs> you know he could do it like hands. Right. So there's a, you know, there's a kind of a, there's a part of your brain that says, okay, well, given that this is the first big movie I've done, I should probably try and, you know, see what they want. Yeah, <laughs> or give give them what what they'd like, you know, what they're hoping for as well as I can, but my own voice is going to come out and stuff I mean you know uh, one of the main tunes of that was way more influenced by Ennio Morricone than Hans Mm -hmm. so but of course Hans is influenced by Ennio Morricone as well so there's going to be some cross pollination yeah of course you know so so I I I took a pragmatic approach to kind of as I said I mean I didn't get into film because of my love of film right I got into my into film because of my love of making music and trying to pay the bills right. so it's a pragmatic art right um <laughs> <laughs> but i mean i i do listening back to some of your stuff you do have your voice does stand out and um you do have that that style that some you know a lot of people will just form to the temp and sound exactly like dark knight or something like that so i, I think it's worthy of applause that you do have a, a strong voice in this industry that has not kind of been 
well, you know, the temp is obviously is there. It's always been there. I've probably been influenced by the temp very much. You might just not know, know yeah, the scores probably. as much. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see. Um, when you're writing, uh, maybe even now, maybe, or maybe when you're starting out, uh, was there ever a doubt? Did you ever doubt yourself? Were you ever saying, I can't do this, this is too much, or I don't know if I can make it, or or was there, did you have to instill confidence in yourself in order to do this job? Um, well, it depends, you know, there's, there's, again, there's practical doubt, mm -hmm. it's like, if I start now, can I finish this in time for the right. scoring sessions? I mean, I forever, and I probably still to this day, I do have that nightmare where I'm in front of an orchestra and haven't written the score yet, mm -hmm. and I'm trying to hum some things to the violas and get them to write it down and play it back. And, you know, it's just a nightmare. It's, right. That's literally a nightmare. So, <laughs> you know, there's a pragmatic, you know, sepsis that comes about from the stress of, you know, just trying to get a hundred minutes of music done in a short amount of time. Um, and I have never been able to underwrite very well. I mean, that's the trick to it. If you really want to write a lot of music quickly, underwrite. Mm -hmm. And actually that works very well for film <laughs> often. And I, I, did, I did, you know, do a TV series where I had three days to write 45 minutes of music. And I did not underwrite. Mm -hmm. Even then, you know, I, I can't help myself. I tend to overwrite, and it's, you know, it's probably part of what makes the f music dub low because mm -hmm. it's overwritten. And but maybe people enjoy it because it's a little bit more, you know, it's got more going on. You know, I mean, really, you can, you know, I have written. I've, I can at times, you know, really calm it down and not do anything. Yeah. Um, but, you know. Born is, is as kind of boring as I can get, really. I mean, it, I just, I don't find it very interesting if it's really ambient. I guess it's just the theme and a lot of electronic percussion. But I think that's also the style of the movie that required that to be kind of laying underneath everything. I guess which maybe why it was, why I thought it was dubbed maybe lower in Born Ultimatum. But also I think Paul, Paul Greengrass is somebody, I mean, I talked to Henry a little bit about Captain Phillips, which I know was a big thing, but... Um, he said he likes it to be, I guess, not, he doesn't want it to comment on it too much. He yeah. doesn't want the music to comment on Yeah, he, he, yeah he's, he's trying to get, he's trying to get a um, realism in film, right. which is, you know, which is sort of a, a hard thing to do because it's film, but... Well, it's the illusion of realism. Yeah. Film is, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, and his favourite score is uh, Battle of Algiers, you know, oh, so, yeah. um, and that's a very effective score that... That Morricone kind of wrote with the director, which I'm sure was a one-off. <laughs> you know, I can't imagine many directors getting to do that with Morricone, but yeah. I, you know, and a lot of it's just a snare drum, and you know, it's it's yeah. kind of um, it's not a score that you can sort of swim in. Right. <laughs> it's a it's a score that functions incredibly effectively, and that's what Paul wants. Mm -hmm. And so, it, that when that's the job, that's that's what you have. That's what you do. Right. And if you can find an artistry within doing that, then it's great. I mean, you know, in 1993 was a hard score to do. It had to be incredibly minimal. But I sort of approached it from trying to write a more of a minimalist piece. Mm -hmm. And so I used a lot of kind of, you know, compositional sort of technique with math and cycles and different numbers and, you know. It's a very percussive score too. Yeah, and all those cycles of percussion are, are, are based on kind of numbers mm -hmm. and things. And, you know, it doesn't matter. It, nobody <coughs> gives a shit about that. But it kept me interested in doing something that I actually was finding hard to do because it's boring to right. write. You know, it's not... It, the inventiveness can't be there right. too clearly because that takes away from the film. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> the only thing I could do was kind of just, you know, play around with the sort of some of the things I'd learnt at college and and kind of put some weirdly, I don't know, functional kind of math into, yeah. into the thing, but you know. But speaking of percussion, that is one of your staple sounds and we talk, I, we interviewed a little bit back with How to Train Your Dragon 2 and we kind of touched on those origins of that, but you do find, finds its way into 
I would say almost every, not every, maybe not every, but a lot of your mm. scores. Yeah. How do you, or, or when you're looking at a scene, do you go, how do you know when percussion is right to use? Like, and you don't just use it for action. You use it for kind of these like maybe breather moments and and stuff within an, a sequence or an arc. But when does it when is it right to use in your opinion? Well, I think it does come from I one of my one of my hang-ups is probably that all you know life is a dance so for me everything's ballet you know, so it's mm. it's attempting to sort of make a ballet score make a rhythmical statement against the against the film probably and you know and after a while people ask for you because you put these pulses and right, this percussion right. in it and then you kind of are stuck in there a little bit drumline was probably <laughs> well no drum drumline was very illuminating i wasn't going to do that because um I, uh, marching bands. The word marching bands in England means something very different from what the drumline right. marching bands were the all about. The high school and the yeah. college football bands. Yeah. yeah, I mean the, the you know the idea of a marching band is is sort of musical horror in England because it's going to be shit. <laughs> but in the American university system and high schools, you know, and actually drumline is all about the South of America and the black colleges and the mm-hmm. black musicians in. You know, in these in these uh, bands, they've they've explored a totally different set of yeah. rules yeah. for it, and it and it wasn't until I heard some of the stuff that they were doing that I got interested in that. And actually, that was uh, that was profoundly interesting for the development of my interest in in rhythm mm. and wow. um, and how to write for percussion. Mm-hmm. Drumline actually was a real turning point because it it made me realize that there was a you know here was pe- here were people you know 80 people who had split up you know kind of a a James Brown funk drum loop yeah. and they'd split it into you know six parts and the interaction of that and then if you put that together with some you know some kind of um, Senegalese drumming and you can start to see this this way that um, you know, percussion groups, mm-hmm. percussion ensembles are, uh, you know, can be written in such an interesting way that then I, I really, I really ran with that from then onwards, and that probably did change how I wrote from drumline onwards. I think. Yeah, I mean, it, that was a great score. I loved it. <laughs> um, let's see. So what you were talking about. You mentioned briefly that the film industry or the film music is shit now nowadays i mean it, it's not very interesting to me uh, is that what, i mean we, because you touched about it that's why you pulled out live action films mostly right because it wasn't interesting to you anymore yeah i mean a, a lot of live action was asking for music from me that i wasn't interested in writing right you know because it was rather dull um so animation seemed to be more open to me continue to overwrite. <laughs> well, that's where so, it calls for it there. Yeah. yeah. So, so I guess that's why I ended up in animation, and, and also I just was finding that a lot of live action films were not the kind of films I, I want to, you know, help birth into the world. They don't. They don't really have any anything I don't know useful to say. It's just more warrior more bullshit, more yeah. fighting, more. It's like you know. It I mean, can be. I think. I mean, if, if you're, if it's with the right director, I think. Like, if you, I don't know if you saw Mad Max, what George Miller yes, ended up doing. No, of course. Yeah. It's, I yeah. It's brilliant action. Oh film. yeah, yeah. You have to understand. I've, I've done a lot of films that I probably shouldn't have done, but I've really tried to stay away from. When I feel that the point of the story is just about a character, a hero who only succeeds because of violence. Okay. Uh, as opposed to, I mean, I just abhor, you know, supporting. If if you, it's amazing if you watch any American TV, any British TV, probably as well, the action TV, action films. You know, going back a long way now, the the question you have to ask yourself politically is: Do we torture political prisoners because we think that gets results? And where does that idea come from? And it comes from Hollywood. Watch any TV film, any TV show, you know, whether it's 24 or anything. It's amazing. Everybody, at some point, somebody gets information, gets information out of the people they need to, the bad guys, by beating them senseless or killing them or threatening to kill them. That's basically torture. So 
we all learn this subliminally mm. and that goes into our society and it comes out as a giant shit that affects us mm. um, when you get this the madness of, of, of you know Abu Ghraib and, uh, and, 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 it, and it's not the fault of the people doing it it's, it right. really is part it's all of society's fault for kind of continuing to think yes of course that must be how it works if we, if we beat somebody senseless they will tell us something if we right. threaten them so, so, so that that idea that continuing all every day, every show, every year, um, you know, all around the world. I mean, how does it how does how does it affect us as a viewing public, and how does it affect the rest of the world looking at, you know, the West, the Hollywood, right. you know, representing the West, you know, Western world, America, the English speaking, you know, empire, as it were. So, I I, I find it very hard to now work on those films and 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 think that. You know, I, if I'm going to write music, I should try and do something. I should try and do something that's a bit more right. useful for the world, shouldn't I? I don't yeah, know. Yeah. <laughs> Until no, I need the I money. I agree completely. Until I need the money. In which <laughs> 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 um, but I mean, the, the would you ever do, I don't know, have you turned down, like, Marvel film? Like, would you do a, a superhero Iron Man movie? I mean, I did X-Men, which did is X -Men. Marvel, but for Fox. Um, but, like, since... Marvel well, has become what it is, and how DC is blowing up, and and would you jump into that superhero genre again? It, it depends. I mean, the reason I did um, X Men was that a Brett asked me because <laughs> he couldn't get Danny, and and he's very nice, and and I, and I and I like him very much, and I actually I like I've I've really liked some of his films. I think he's a very uh, underappreciated filmmaker, um, and great fun, uh, and I. And I it's a, and I like the I like the um, the gay uh, metaphor in right. it, um, and um, you know there's lots of metaphors in those comic books. Um, it just it was at a particular time when you know crazy right wing nutcases were trying to sort of set up places where you could um, you know again beat the gay out of people right. as if it was a you know a choice <laughs> and. And so a film that, you know, and it's one of the biggest openings, it's certainly the biggest opening I've ever been involved in, you know. So you, you have a huge audience. Right. And anything that in that can say, even at a subliminal level, is that, you know, people are... <laughs> there's things about people that are the way they are. Right. And why should we have to find a cure for some things, you know? Right. I mean, dysfunction is dysfunction if it messes with your life if it doesn't mess with your life it's not really dysfunction if it doesn't right. hurt other people right. so um so you know i i, I kind of like doing that so that was quite sub i felt that was quite a subversive thing to do really yeah. and i do one if you've thought it was subversive but most of them aren't very subversive i i, yeah. I wouldn't say i've seen many come up recently <laughs> that you know i mean my son was telling me about deadpool and i thought oh maybe that's subversive but no it's just i think about violence again it's, a, you know, so. it's all about violence yeah, yeah cursing so. and r-rated but yeah um but do you get do you have the opportunity to see films like do, in your schedule like do you go to the movies oh yeah so yeah, you sure. see everything that comes out yeah, on television yeah. And yeah i just went to see uh, mission impossible 17 <laughs> uh you know and um i liked it yeah no it's great yeah it's great and um you did a great job with the score i thought it's <laughs> Well, yeah, that's a, there's a, there's an interesting sort of, um, you know, I I love the TV series of that, so yeah. I, you know, and, and I'm a big fan of one of one of my favorite one of my favorite and most influential albums is the Cat by Lalo Schifrin. Mm -hmm. uh, wait, sorry, it's, it's actually uh, Jimmy Smith. It's the organist Jimmy Smith, but Lalo Schifrin did all the arrangements and, um, and. And uh, it's amazing. It's amazing. I wrote wrote a couple of things for it, and uh, and just uh, so that for me, Lolo Schifrin is a, is a particular kind of jazz yeah. that I have a great fondness for, both in TV and out of TV. And so I always loved that. I mean, my favorite, you know, Mission Impossible score was was Danny's. I I, I did Very think well, that yeah. was an incredible piece of that's an incredible piece of writing, um, and well, both from. Answers. <laughs> well, well, Hans was. Yeah, I mean, again, for John, it's. For John yeah, I mean, it's 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 a reaction to the nature of the film. I mean, I think all of the, all people who do really good scores for films are making the score right for the film. 
So a lot of people will shit on that score, but I really enjoy it. Like, I thought it was great. <laughs> I, can't, I can't really remember that one it was as really well, cool. except for YouTube. <laughs> didn't they didn't they do a version of the theme in four <laughs> or something which i remember thought was a bit odd but you know i'd be fascinated to hear what what uh, Anne silvestri did for the first one as oh, well yeah, i'm yeah, sure yeah. it was brilliant right. as well you know so you know there's been great music written for these things yeah. and you know <laughs> and so it's always interesting to hear what people do with it you know so. <laughs> did you see man from uncle I did. I, I know that. Daniel. Yeah, Daniel's great. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. That no, was I, great. I, 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 I go I here. My my son and I used to go uh, go kart racing in London with him, <laughs> and uh, and he's very he's a real he's a really wonderful guy, yeah. and uh, and I, I like I like very much like what he did for that. You know, he had this kind of mix of authenticity and 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 you know just kind of balls as well, which a lot more comedy. <laughs> of course, sure. That's the authenticity. Guy, yeah, you know. love, yeah, he, I asked him, I was like, so about the influence of Morricone work? He's like, there's always going to be an influence of Morricone. Of course, work. of course, yeah. <laughs> so you're we just, you mentioned now Alan Silvestri, he wrote you know, for uh, the first Mission Impossible. What's the biggest film that you've gotten fired off of that you're willing to share? Armageddon. You got fired off Armageddon? Yes, I mean, I wouldn't say I was really on it, but I tried to get on it, and right. Hans gave me a... A shot and I gave it a good shot and I didn't get it at all and uh-huh. and uh, and and you know and it made me realize that there's a point in my brain where I I'm not terribly populist I'm not mm-hmm. good some people are really good at understanding what can be popular and how people like things right and it's not a function of my uh, abilities to to do it for an ana- ana- analytical reason mm-hmm. where you can say, oh, I can see what people are liking, I can absorb that and I can make right. that into something. I just either like things and then they get absorbed and if they come out as part of the way I work, then great. But if I can't, if I can't see it from a, I, I can't see it from quite such a sort of a, a you, know, an, you know, scientific view and some people are really good at that. Right. And so I wasn't, I didn't, I had a totally different film in my head, you know. Yeah. So I was writing the music for that film. And, you know, and Jerry Bruckheimer is a very smart guy. So, you know, he's listening to it going, well, this doesn't strike me as the kind of film we're making. So, you know, right. it makes much more sense when you look at it from like that. And you go, okay, I didn't have, I, I wasn't creating the music that they were make, they're making the film for. You know, along the way, you kind of you get you go up for films and you don't get them many times, especially right. the, you know in your younger years. <laughs> and you've got to ask yourself, well, why? You know, and you know, one film I came up with a whole theory before before I heard a word the director said. That's the dumbest thing you could do. It's like <laughs> might be better to wait and hear what they're thinking right. of before you kind of expound something based on the script. Yeah. Um, you know, you can be excited about the script, and you can you can really look at the story and understand the story and be excited about that part of it. But it might be best to wait until you've <laughs> seen how they're making the film and the tone of the film. Right. You know? And I, I've done I've made that mistake several times, and sometimes I get fired, and sometimes I don't. You know, um, or you know, mainly I, I I rarely get fired because. I would be fired off every movie if it wasn't for the fact that I write the score six or seven times. I mean, you know, yeah, yeah. some cues get written a lot. You know, I was on a movie and they wanted to fire me and my agent got a call from the filmmakers and they said, um, we need another composer because it's not working with John. We don't like what he's doing. And so my agent, being a very, very smart person, Laura, yeah, well, she said, OK, well, you need somebody who's really kind of flexible and can just kind of come in at the last minute and hear what you... You have to remember, because an agent's got loads of composers, so you know, they're quite happy to find another composer for a filmmaker. But Laura basically said to them, so you need somebody who can do it kind of fast, who's flexible, and you can just talk to and say, you know, this isn't what we don't want, see let's try a few things until we do want so they said yeah that's exactly the person so who do you suggest and, and she said well why don't you hire john <laughs> and they were puzzled and she said look have you asked him did you tell him you didn't like it have you asked him to try some other things and they went well no we just don't like what it is <laughs> so yeah. she made them come back and they 
he said, well, we, we don't really like what you're doing. And I said, well, fine, why didn't you tell me that? Right. Yeah. Can you I say what someone yeah. is, or do you not want to say? Yeah, it's, it's, best, it's best some of these things okay. stay a thing. But, you know, <laughs> in the end, you know, again, it's that thing of what's good for the film is good for me. Right. Not what's good for me is good for the film. I mean, yeah. it's, it's like it's good for you, you get you kicked you, out the door. Yeah, <laughs> you you know what you want from the film. You let's try and get what you want out of the film. Right. It's obviously going to come through the prism of my brain and my fetishes musically <laughs> and my understanding of things. But you know, I can write very different things. So let's try some things. Looking at uh, there is uh, one genre that I don't think. Correct me if you if I'm wrong, but you've never done a, a horror film, have you? No, not really. I mean, is there any interest at all to tap into that genre? Has it just never come up, or do you turn them away? Like, do you just? I, I, I um, I did a tiny little, sort of stop motion film, before I came to Hollywood, um, with a couple of French brothers mm -hmm. who used to make, or do make films there, and they they did adverts, and I, I met them on adverts in Paris and, and uh, they asked me to do this little short film and it, it was called Les Capins Sauvages which is the uh, what's it the it's like the 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 savage shoes mm -hmm. <laughs> something like, I can't remember Escarpin, I think they're it's like um, loafers it's like yeah. a really weird kind of thing and it was just this crazy black and white little thing you can see it on YouTube and so I, I did write some stuff but you have to understand that the horror genre is um is a bit joyless and so it, it I, somehow they kind of the film that they made which is this kind of little tiny experimental mm -hmm. thing i found a lot of joy in it even though it seems to be very horrific because right. it, it isn't because it's, it's stop motion it's like dolls and there's no blood and right. it's kind of just weird and it's and I so I like that so mm -hmm. I'm more likely to do a an experimental you know kind of film that sounds really weird than a horror genre because horror just doesn't it doesn't grab grab me as there's nothing I there's nothing I can I particularly enjoy as a film viewer and then it tends to be that you have to write music that frightens everyone right and the problem with that is that what we believe to be frightening music is actually I can I actually listen to and I actually find it kind of <laughs> quite <laughs> wonderful <laughs> I, uh, I I see you know it's like if you listen to you know Ligeti and Penderecki uh, you know you can see it as as music of you know tortured souls right and certainly if you put a title on it that's that or if you put it against imagery like that but you could also see that it's a it's a some more aleatoric music can be it sounds to me like somebody attempting to reach transcendence mm. which isn't horror right so i you know i'd be more likely to write a horror score if i could write something really subversive for it i don't know like disco or something <laughs> you know or do a, you know, I mean, I'd do a, an EDM kind of score or something yeah. like that, you know, for it. I mean, maybe that would be more effective, more interesting to me. But the films generally don't. So uh, right. I'm I mean, the, the genre itself. I mean, I think recently I've seen a rise in some pretty cool little independent horror films that have been coming up. But most of the studio stuff, like the kind of PG thirteen, uh, Ouija board, or you know, Nightmare on Elm Street remake and stuff like that. It really is kind of the, not the slasher stuff. I really don't care about. But yeah. like. Um, like I think what Hans did with the ring and gore was yeah. really good. Yeah, no, I, wouldn't, um, see, I wouldn't call that horror. Yeah, it's not. It's more. It doesn't. That's, I'm not looking to get just, scared. I like. Yeah, it's a thriller. Kind of more in psychological type stuff. So. Yeah, yeah. So and he now he's working with gore for wellness, cure for wellness. So that's gonna yeah. be right. interesting. Hans yeah. jumping back in that genre, but yeah. <laughs> you've also never done a video game. Would you ever do a video game? Um, I would, but again, a lot of them are just kind of. Um, pointless violence. Right, um, th first person, third person, fifth right. person shooter. I don't know what it's called, but you know it's not very interesting <laughs> to me at all. But um, what would be interesting is the idea of an interactive story, mm -hmm. um, and I think there's going to be a lot more of that going to start happening in cinema. I think the 
you know, the three D goggles, right. um, and be able to be inside a story and be able to pick your own view of it, which, you know, the three D head, you know, um, these kind of headsets. Yeah. where they can sense what you're doing, how you move and look, and virtual you can really see, yeah, yeah, virtual reality. That's going to be interesting filmmaking, um, storytelling, and maybe it would be interesting for music as well. I don't know. I mean, I, I'm interested in writing music that touches people, affects people, and if if I need to make some money, I can, you know... I can make films, <laughs> yeah. but if there's some other things out there that are just kind of off the, I mean, I, at college I was doing, you know, um, I was really doing, um, you know, sort of art music, as it were, right. for, um, you know, inter interactive pieces even then, and, you know, this is 30 years ago, um, site-specific site kind of art installations with sound and music and wow. I used to have fun with those and and performance art as well so I was in a performance art group with Gavin and uh, and Michael Petrie who's mm. still a friend and just wrote the libretto for the the uh, the requiem we just did so I you know I never say never but but the um, video games don't you know, I'm not. I've never played them, so I probably right. don't really understand them. Well, well enough. talk to Lauren. Lauren doesn't really play them either, but he does a lot. He? <laughs> yeah, he just likes to write. Lauren just writes. <laughs> he is a writer. Yeah. Yeah, he'll uh, he turns out, out a movie yeah. in one weekend. I know. He's so we talk about Terminator. He's like, oh yeah, I wrote all the themes in one weekend. I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah, sure. No, he's very fluent. Yeah, he is. Um, I was just looking at it outside of uh, if you could be any role on a film besides the composer what would you be director writer cinematographer stuntman stuntman yeah and the cars driving or like a stunt coordinator coordinating the stunts maybe doing them i don't know you know i mean i i wanted to be a stuntman when i was a kid really yeah i used to blow myself up and set fire <laughs> to things and are you a, a daredevil in your no not anymore I just, you know i got top heavy and <laughs> i realized <laughs> how much it hurt you know but as a kid i used to be fascinated by all that sort of stuff. Wow. Yeah. That's uh, interesting. Setting off gas bombs all over the place and things. A little pyro technique. Yeah, I mean, I was really interested in that. And, you know, and just, I, I've always, and that probably drew me to action films to be, you know, yeah, and yeah. maybe my understanding of action right. films is because of that. Yeah. And I, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to sort of persuade people that there should be an Academy Award for stunt. You know, and you watch Mad Max. Oh my God, yeah. That's, you know, there's several there. You know, because that's just incredible stuff, right. and and I just think stunt guys are the, you know, they have the coolest job. Yeah. <laughs> Fucking dangerous. But <laughs> it's dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. Your insurance must be expensive. <laughs> yeah, but you'd have to be very fit and uh, and uh, and have nerves of steel. Yeah. And as I got older, I was I became less fit, and and my my nerves became more kind of soft nylon, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> silky. But outside of music, do you, outside of your job, which is this, I mean, it was your life also, not just your job, but what else, what else do you love to do? Do you like to travel? What do you like to, what, what are your hobbies outside of writing music? Uh, I play tennis. Tennis? Yes. Um, do you have a court, I think? Yes, there? I do. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's the purpose. Is, I didn't buy the studio because the studio I bought to go to the tennis court. Um, and, um, yeah, I like playing tennis. Um, you know, I, I'd love to make music for fun again. Yeah. You know, I, I'd really love to. I must try. You know, I tell you, singing in a choir. I'd love to try and sing in a choir again. I'm clearly not good enough to be in a quartet again because that's an amazing thing. If you can play well enough to be in a quartet, even if it's a bit shitty, it's good. Or an orchestra. I'm not good. I mean, I'm just. I'd have to work too hard. Yeah. Um, you know, but I, I'd love to play ba bass in. A, you know, I had great fun on the on the um, on the stage with hands on at the. Hollywood Bowl, you know, playing yeah. bass for a couple of numbers at the end there, and it was great. Bass is the instrument to play <laughs> on stage because it's like. I remember a while back uh, you guys did some rooftop concert at DreamWorks or yeah. something. Yeah, yeah, and I yeah. played the accordion, I played keyboards, and yeah, I played yeah. things like you know the and Hans and I played the guzhangs, you know, these harps and stuff <laughs> like that, and we did it a couple of times for in, in London, in England, for this uh, Kung Fu Panda Day thing, you know, we did, and that was fun. But the Hollywood Bowl, when we just you know just playing 
kind of some some kind of Motowny kind of bass stuff. <laughs> it's great. That's great. So I, I should join a band, I think. But uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I'm, I. Reason I do music is that I not be capable of doing anything else. I think you know nothing else really interested me a great deal. Right. I mean, I wouldn't be a professional tennis player because it wouldn't interest me enough, you right. know. But I enjoy playing hobby. tennis. Mm. Yeah. So. <laughs> You, you are doing music for fun. You have a concert piece coming up, so that's coming. Yeah. It's, is it finished? It's it is finished. It's recorded. Uh, it, it's in the Festival Hall in London, 6th of March, 2016, oh, wow. with the Philharmonia Chorus, the Philharmonia Orchestra. And it's um, about 37 or 38 minutes long. Um, and it's about the evening before the First World War. Right, the anniversary and, uh, of it, yeah. Yeah, and... Uh, you know, it's been very interesting to do. Um, it made me realise, I think, you know, I had guilt about sort of leaving writing sort of behind to, to be a prostitute in Hollywood. <laughs> but I, I realised that one of the things that I do like about um, the music I like, I like to, I've always liked to listen to, is the programmatic, programmatic nature of it. Um, even if it wasn't actually programmatic, it, it, I, for me, the greatest symphonies were stories, and I liked them. And I didn't really realise this until I s became more, more involved in storytelling. And so, I think for me, uh, I'm trying to develop the music that I can write, and it is just going to be based on the things that interest me. And right. the things that interest me are storytelling. I think so. The music will all ha always have that. In this particular case, it's very, it's more literal than uh, other times. Um, but you know, in other times, it's going to be, you know, virtually impossible for people to, mm -hmm. you know, hear a story in there. But it will be the fundamentals that I write upon will, because I found having a story helped guide me. You know, because going from writing for film for so many years to not writing it for film again. Shocking. Like yeah, it's like, shocking, where, yeah. well, what do I do? Where do well, I start? You know? agree, yeah. yeah, so, and I suddenly realized that actually having a kind of a dramatic through line um, made more sense to me as to how to construct the music. And then in, in, uh, in a compositional way, not just in a, right. it's not, you know, it's, it's not, it's not, um, you know, uh, Peter and the Wolf. It's, right. it's you know, it, it's just about how to structure, you know, postmodern world it's like mm -hmm. we've had every conceivable kind of music has been written up to this point so right. where do you start how do you not be just everything right. that has come before and of course you are but <laughs> it's a question of if you can mix it up enough into something that interests you and so I've been pursuing that and I've been trying to um, find my own voice in that and it's going to take a while I wouldn't say we're there yet at mm -hmm. all but this piece is a beginning and there's another piece I did, which is a 16-minute piece for a gospel choir and orchestra. Oh, wow. Okay. I haven't got any performances of that, but that will be on the record as well. With so the, it'll be the, 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 the World War One piece? And, and the gospel choir okay. piece, yeah. And that will make one record. And hopefully up about Christmas, maybe, come out. Um, or at least in time for next year's concert. Yeah. Um, and, and then we'll see what happens. You know, writing is something that when I feel I have the right reason to do it is something I do enjoy um, and the pressure is worth it if at the end of it you can you can listen to it and think okay well it's it might not be very good but it sounds like me right <laughs> <laughs> well I'm yeah, excited to hear so. it because that's it's uh, it's rare for composers to get out of that I don't know that groove because I, I know uh, Penka Koneva, she's a composer, and she yeah. just did a, which I think is an interesting idea. I mean, she's trying to get her voice out there more, so she did a, uh, an album called the The Woman Astronaut, which is completely a theoretical concept album, but it's a score with a narrative, and in the liner notes, she says, Act One, Act Two, Act Three, and <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I think it's you know, to have music that is born from, you know, the composer versus of the picture, I think is an interesting. Interesting. Yeah. So did you write a narrative for the, for the piece? Or did no, you... history did. I mean, right. the okay. only thing was that nobody knows that part of the story very well. Okay. That, you know, and, and what interested me was that there's, it was from a book called Humanity, uh, History of the 20th Century, and it was defining this 
this possibility that um, a book by an, another historian called Barbara Tuchman, mm -hmm. called The Guns of August, highlighted to JFK when he read it the ease with which a very kind of weak leader, the Kaiser, was persuaded to move forward with the war when everybody else was trying to pull back by a general um, uh, and and perhaps that affected JFK's decision making during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, now that fundamentally means we are we might all be alive now mm. because yeah. he had the he'd read something and and it maybe fortified a view perhaps he had right. already, which is that you know people who are paid to make war will tend to try and find work for themselves right. Um, and then I looked at the story that it was, you know, the moment it was based on, and I did, did indeed discover that there had been this moment when they, when peace had been attempted, um, when everyone realised that um, this would have been a disastrous war. Right. Then, literally one or two nights before, you know, the Germans um, kind of ran into Belgium, and the man that had been responsible for the plan. Um, stamped his feet and and screamed and and made sure that the thing he'd worked 10 years on and put all his hopes and dreams of heroism and his his position in history as as a he was from a great f military family in Prussia he wanted to fulfill it mm -hmm. and so that hubris that w which we were all capable of right. uh, and in that's the irony of the piece I'm writing is that it's a lot of hubris involved in <laughs> thinking you can write a war requiem. Um, so he stamped his feet and had a hissy fit, and um, and World War One moved forward. And really, it was a an incredibly human moment that fucked the 20th century, mm -hmm. and we still pay the price for that. Right. You know, everything could, of course, be different, but. It really, it fundamentally collapsed so many, you know, possibles um, and created such a kind of a um, catastrophe mm. that, you know, the Second World War wasn't the Second World War, it was a continuation, really. It was a, you know, the, it was the environment that Nazism could grow in. Yeah. Uh, communism came about because of the environment that the cost to Russia um, of you know obviously an already corrupt government corrupt you know right. um, system just changed into a different corrupt system but those the roots of revolution come from you know from disaster and that that was a disaster for every country in the world uh, so many millions of people died uh, who weren't anything to do with the fighting uh, who were part of the empires of the various you know, forces involved. Um, you know, millions and millions of Arab Arabs died. And we nobody even thinks about that. Right. It's like you know, it 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 created a you know the beginning of of a kind of a an anger against the West <laughs> in yeah. across yeah. the Middle East. Uh, it created bad politics. It created yeah. bad economies uh, that could only be sustained by you know dictatorships that got fed into by the paranoia of, you know, America versus communism. Uh, there's so many different, you know, the Mujahideen, you know, become ISIS, you know, via... Right, yeah. You know, it's like, you know, f feeding weapons into these, you know, systems of, of, uh, of uh, you know, of discourse. Um, is just the the irony of right. of the twentieth century, but it really start you know. So, I was fascinated by the idea that you could see kind of see the pink the 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 prick that started it all <laughs> in in several term, in several yeah. meanings, and that he could be any of us, you right. know. And he was doing it for very human reasons because he, you know, none of us like to work on something for 10 would want to work for something on 10 years yeah. that guaranteed in your brain that that you're you're going to have that kind of um 
the heroic um, place in history that your uncle had, because his uncle was a very, very was an incredibly important um, general, and um, so he, you know, he came from a place where it made sense to him that it was his role in life right. was to fulfil his destiny and to make sure that Germany and Prussia had its its moment, you know, in the sun, right. and that they could they could get back all the land that they lost to France, right. even though his uncle had got some of it back, but he could get the rest of it back, and then they could, for once and for all, make sure that Russia would never threaten them again. And these were these the three countries really involved were three cousins um, who used to play together. They were all cousin. They were all um, nephews of Queen Victoria, the Tsar, the Kaiser, and uh, the King of England. You know. And so they were all brats. They were all idiotic brats. Yeah. And then all it took was one more idiotic brat <laughs> to come and, and just stamp their feet. So, right. I mean, it's a children's tale. It's the child within, right. you know, that comes to the surface and damages everybody else around them simply because they're so willful. Right. So that fascinated me. So I wrote a piece. I, I got Michael Petri to write the libretto and it's really perhaps a bit operatic but I wanted to start with an oratorio because operas are really expensive to do. So. <laughs> does, it, does it have a name, the piece? Yes, yeah, it's called uh, A Prussian Requiem. A Prussian Requiem. And it's neither a requiem and Prussia doesn't exist anymore. Right. So it's, you know, it's frailty of mankind, you know, based on my understanding of what a requiem is from the ones that I've loved in the past, whether right. it's Brahms or Britain, um, and I can't, I don't use any of the requiem mass because I'm an atheist and it wouldn't, it wouldn't help my mm. purpose. But the structure of it is kind of, it's structured like a requiem, and I hope that it picks you up at the beginning and with the, I mean, the idea that it opens with, you know. Moltke, who's the the general, you know, kind of glorying in the romanticism of war, and the what he would hope he could he could uh, bring to this history of war, this great history of the warrior history his family had and right. the Prussia had, and so and for you know musically it's a kind of a little trip through the twentieth century as well. I mean, if you look at the Belle Epoque, you know, the optimism of the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century, before the First World War. Right. You know, all the glorious, most of the music I like actually comes from that period. Um, once the Second First World War happens, you know, a lot of music was very different and because the world changed. And right. so, you know, it's probably a bunch of fetish styles wrapping around my head and you're just using the voice of this kind of child man mm. and probably realizing that that's me as much as was him and could be anybody um, and so I, I just tried to make a you know a, a, a romantic it, uh, the first the first I think the part is yes it says um, idiotically romantic with passionate conviction that's the first <laughs> line the first line of the tenor solo it was Moltke, and and uh, and that that's what the whole piece is really. It's just a it's a little kind of um, commentary on I don't know how I I see I mean, one of, one of the reasons I I did write it as well was to try and explain the difficulty of being a pacifist mm. um, when you talk about the Second World War, and the Second World War seems impossible to defend from a pacifistic point of view. Right. It was it's too late. And I realized it was too late. And so how do you talk about that? Well, you talk about the First World War. You talk, well, why did we even get to the Second World War? What happened? Why did war start? And of course, it's normally economic. And there's a lot of economic, economic reasons why the First World War happened. And that's, you know, when various forces are, are, you know, are trying to get more and more land. But the actual spark, you know, which they always talk about being the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand. Mm -hmm. I, I like the idea that this 
it wasn't that. It wasn't a violent act mm-hmm. that actually started it. It was actually an act of willful, willful childishness that actually started it. And and so, uh, I, you know, that probably would never have occurred to me had I not, you know, been so fortunate to work with so many good storytellers that right, yeah. realized the significance of, of, you know, of such a, uh, the idea of the small moment being the, the meaning of everything. I mean, wow. it's it's a it's a simple, metaphorical idea, but um, it, it it fascinated me for several years, and so, and it was one of those things where you you were saying to people, "I'm going to stop working on films, and I'm going to write something," <laughs> and and uh, and it got to that point where I realised I had to shit or get off the ball. Right. <laughs> so, so it's done now, and in March we'll find out if people but think it's. That must be so satisfying for you to have that. Well, it's a relief yeah. as it is to ever, you know, when you're on the that's bathroom. Something that's but like that many years in your head, and it's finally. Yeah, I mean, obviously, the concern is whether or not it it represents the uh, the thought process right. that I put into it, but more importantly, whether it actually kind of will mean anything to anybody else. Right, I'm sure it will. I mean, are you planning on doing? Are you doing in London? Are you doing an LA performance? Don't know. No, nothing past uh, London at the moment. But uh, the album. The record right. version of it will, I don't know, tell us things. If people don't react to it that way, then maybe they'll react to the live performance. We did a little bit of it in um, Uruguay, right. and that was effective. It was it was pretty effective, you know. So uh, interesting experiment. Hmm. Well, I cannot wait. That's going to be amazing. <laughs> That's going to be kind of still a long way away because I probably won't hear it till next Christmas. So. <laughs> a little bit more uh, uh, lighter. <laughs> questions what's your favorite drink to cope with stress favorite alcoholic beverage stress or just cope what's your favorite drink I don't know I was just trying to make it seem like a reason that you drink <laughs> is, is there a is this, this, you never need a reason to drink I mean in my opinion well um, uh, it depends really I mean uh, I I must say one of the things about living in LA is that you know Californian wine is incredible. It's very good. Yeah, fuck the French. <laughs> that stuff's expensive. Yeah. And in my opinion, you know, so I, I've been enjoying a lot of very good red wine. Um, but uh, my friends introduced me to the Madras, which is uh, vodka, orange juice, and cranberry juice. Yeah. It's great. It's Sounds really like easy, but I do also animal. like pims. I I do love a pims. If I want to get really drunk, <laughs> I drink champagne and pims. Cause pims is the most dangerous drink on earth. It's it's like I think the equivalent is Long Island iced tea. Right. So you just kind of swig it back <laughs> like a like it's on a, on a really hot day like today. Yeah. In fact, you're actually lucky to find that I haven't been drinking pims. So <laughs> I'm bummed. I would have been alive. <laughs> I mm. should have brought something. Um. Do you ever listen to any of your old scores? Do you ever revisit? Um, we did recently because I did um, also recorded some suites. Are you doing a compilation album? Right? Yeah, and uh, it turned out nicely. I mean, still editing it, mm-hmm. see as well. But it was very interesting to to hear the Philharmonia play some things, you know, um, and uh, and some of it worked, you know, w- way better than I expected, <laughs> you know, just as music as it, you know, right. kind of, and. Uh, but is it is it weird to to go back and listen to something that yeah, you've I mean, written? I yeah. hate watching the films again. I I won't watch the films. Oh, so you've judged. never no. rewatched anything. No, you have you ever have you ever? I mean, the, the only time you'll ever see it kind of in an audience perspective is probably at the premiere, and then it's like done. You'll never yeah. see it. I'll never see it unless it's kind of on TV and you can't kind of get rid of it. Or, <laughs> um, you know, I mean, sometimes you, something will come on and you and you listen because you think, oh, I remember ten years ago thinking that was utter shit. <laughs> and what's my opinion of it now? You know. So there's, you know, you, you do a sort of a refractory right. kind of perspective on it sometimes just to see how distance has changed it. Right. But, you know, I mean, I honestly don't remember how most of it's written. You know, I mean, right. it's like you, you look at it and you think, well, I don't remember how I did that. And um, it's like, how do you how do you end up with that series of notes? Right. You know, why did that seem like the right thing at the time? Right. and and um, what were the other options? Would they have been better? Would they have been worse? I mean, 
some things definitely you think I'm lucky I kind of I found that but other times you think really you just didn't but you couldn't be bothered, more bothered than that to just you know it's always sometimes a little I look at these pieces at a distance and I always think that they're very kind of staid and they're kind of um, square right you know I wish they had more fluidity and flexibility and, mm. and, uh, and you know and more kind of whoosh to them sometimes <laughs> But I was wondering if we could play a little Name That Tune, because I have these pieces here that have, I've been, I don't know, they've been on the internet, I found them. Well, first of all, I need to know this, because you use this thing in, in Born, Vangel has used it in um, Alexander, and Harry used it in Man on Fire. And I need to know where it came from. And it's in... Spectrosonics. Do you know the, the piece, that I'm t the thing that I'm talking about? Well, it's a, it's a loop, it's a drum loop. That... African drum loop. That they make it made it special so it's uh, oh that thing what, well not that but Tibetan blah 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 when this it's a sample in, right here that's just that's a sample of a Tibetan that well the, the drum loop underneath is special okay. yeah yeah because you use it Harry use it and I was like <laughs> <laughs> and there there is these things on the internet that have been floating around and I, I mentioned to you briefly at that DreamWorks thing where we were chatting and you said that they were all named wrong um, but it was like I guess it was a demo you did uh, like what is, what is this song it's called Faith Hope and Charity oh yeah what is that for um, like, I think I wrote that for um, oh were those demos something yeah it was a demo for a film that I didn't uh -huh. get I can't remember which one because there might was, have been Armageddon really <laughs> yeah this I don't one, know this is, I don't know. Are those names correct? A blur. Uh, it was in French. Is that something? Uh, someone, is that yes. correct? Yeah. That, yes. That, so that was me trying to write a suite for um, something. I can't remember. Uh huh. You know. And then so I used the tune. I don't know if that is correct. Dumbass. Yeah. Dumbass. Um, <laughs> uh, dumbass. I can't remember what I was writing it for, and you know, I mean, I used to write a lot of stuff to try right. and get films. And uh, then you'd use it in another movie. So, so this is like that, a demo reel just to get you work kind of early on. Yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because this yeah. is definitely chicken run here. Dirty, it says Dirty Dozen. Which yes, is, that's right. Which is chicken run, right? Yeah, it's a tune. <laughs> Ended up in chicken run, yeah. So, well. There's one tune I wrote for chicken run that they didn't want in chicken run. And I think I tried it in Shrek. Uh-huh. And they didn't want it in Shrek. So... As a laugh, I now put it in it. I try it on every movie I do for DreamWorks. Really? Yeah. Pull the same tune out and see if anyone <laughs> spots it. Because there, there, in that uh, Dirty Dozen track, there was another piece that was, I think you used in Bolt. It was... Oh, yeah. There's all sorts of stuff. Yeah. yeah. I mean, <laughs> but, you know, that's the thing is that you, you write and stuff comes out. You're trying to make it fit people's films, but right. sometimes it's very hard to... <laughs> get it right for their <laughs> film so you write because it's more important to actually get the flow going because right. otherwise you just sit there and you don't do anything so you write and you try and construct things and 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 actually sometimes i've written the tune again not realizing i'd written it before so it's like people say well do you pull out a bunch of pieces of paper sometimes i do right. and sometimes i sit down and i start to play and it actually comes out as a tune that you've probably been thinking about for 10 years right and it's and you maybe change it as well and you fix it. So sometimes there's other versions of tunes that are really similar and then get developed and mm. things like that. It's just part of the you know, Process. construction of melodic writing is is uh, you know, and, and grooves as well, you know. So sometimes you'll write a groove with a tune and you like the groove and so you end up not using the tune but using the groove and things. There's one thing in Happy Feet I wrote, I would really like that groove. So I really wrote a different tune on top of it for Lorax, you know, and yeah. and they're all things that you know don't get used, right? And they seem interesting, so I always think, well, fuck it, I should stick yeah. it in something, don't you know. Throw it out. Right. Yeah, I mean, you know, <laughs> and sometimes you you need like three tunes, mm -hmm. four tunes mm -hmm. for a movie, and you've written three, and you're like searching around, and then they say, well, what about the, you know, the bad guy tune, and you think, oh, I just got to fight. I haven't written a bad guy tune, and then, <laughs> so you you know you dig out something and you yeah. just try it. I mean, I've tried I try things at meetings, just to make it look like you've been productive. 
because I could have spent two weeks on yeah. one tune. And they'll like that tune, but then they'll go, well, what about the other tunes? And you go, well, here's some other stuff right. that you spent no time on whatsoever, <laughs> but makes it look like you've yeah, actually kind of been so working. Prepared. You know, so, and, but, and you know that, they, I often I know that they're wrong, but mm -hmm. it just kind of fills, it's a filler. You know, yeah, sometimes yeah. they're filler. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, you know, I, 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 I write with great difficulty. So anything that helps me get the gig, anything that helps me get through the gig, and anything that helps the film strikes me as being a good idea. So I kind of, I'll do anything I can, and stealing from myself is a, you know, stealing from yourself as a film composer is almost, you know, legally required. I mean, it's part of the thing. I think it's what makes you an you know, or so, what makes someone an artist. Yeah, I mean, doing the same things over and over are not very deliberate sometimes. They are, right. they're subconscious. Right. But, you know, that's what makes you sound the way you do because you can't help yourself. You fall into these kind of patterns. And, right. and things, you know. <laughs> I mean, I'd like to, you know, Hans is, has been amazing at being able to sort of re, oh, sorry. Re, you know, reinvigorate his, his, uh, his style in totally different ways, you know, and, you know, at certain points. I mean, totally. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and he'll spend a few years, you know, kind of, with that style and people love that style and they want that style and, and everyone uses that style and you yeah. have to change it up and well he doesn't have to doesn't i mean to, he could carry on there's lots of composers who stand it sound exactly the same <laughs> you know at the beginning of their careers that they did at the end but you know it, it is it's a it's a again it's pragmatic art it's not really an art it's a pragmatic art mm -hmm. so you're not doing it just to make music right. you're making music to try and help a collaborator in their in their art right. and so function is everything you know well, well I've, 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 we've run through the whole list john good thank you so much for your time it's i mean this has been the most enlightening things so i really appreciate it i know i Maybe this is not your favorite thing to do, but uh, talk. I know you, in the past you said you didn't like talking about no. your work. But <laughs> well, I only don't like talking because if I have to write, because. Okay. But at the moment I'm not writing, so it's fine. If you if you're talking about if somebody says to you, how do you write a score, and you start right. blabbering about how you write a score, I found, and this has started on Happy Feet, really, is I found that the next day I'd sit down and I'd start to write, and I couldn't. It gave me the worst wow. blockage, because my brain would say come on, what's the big problem? You just explained it to everybody yesterday. You know, it's easy. Yeah. Just, what's the big fucking deal? And so I get hooked up, I get, you know, caught up on that. And, wow. and, and so I decided at that point, right, well, I'll stop talking about it because, you know, I think it's messing with the, my ability to be actually do it. So, <laughs> you know, so now it's okay because I'm not writing, you know, right. but... Just That's another thing I was going to ask, just, uh, just uh, to maybe tie it all and end everything. That you're, you, you you said you want to write music that affects people, and th is that, I mean, you are an A-list composer. You are so many films. Your music is. I mean, I found your music when I was young. A lot of people do. Is that in your thought at all? That the fact that your music is out in the world, affecting people, people are listening to it, of millions of people. Does that is that flattering to you? Does that you not think about it? Is it something that is maybe maybe intimidating, or is it? In your thought um, process at all, the fact well, that your music is kind of part of the fabric of out there in the world. Well, you know, of course. I mean, it, it's it's a, it's a, it's an honor when people actually listen and enjoy mm -hmm. what you write properly. But I mean, I really am trying to write better because if I compare what I write to things I feel have got a value mm. then I, I still have such a long way to go right. so I I'm I don't mean to be dismissive of people enjoying my music but you know I, I have the arrogance to think that I can do better so and I should I mean I, I think you know it's a it's a Again, it's, it's you know the irony of hubris um, <laughs> is that I'm I don't think very highly of my abilities, but I think that I should think highly of my you know struggle. Yeah. 
yeah. because the struggle is worth something because I know that I was on the receiving end of people's music that whether they struggled or not doesn't right. actually matter to me as a listener whether it popped off you know the end of the pencil or was created you know some incredibly difficult way ultimately I would listen to music as a kid and every day I would have listened to music and it would have meant that I could transcend and so if if I can help if I can write music that other people can transcend with, which is a terribly pretentious bullshit way of saying <laughs> enjoy. Right. But there's enjoy and then there's enjoy so that it kind of it takes you leave your sort of your presence mm -hmm. here and you kind of can be you can be transported with it. If you can be transported in music, that's I think that's the most marvellous thing for me. So if I can carry on and do it for other people, great. But I don't try and think of it that way because right. that would freak me out and <laughs> and I've still got such a long lot of work to do to try and improve my writing so I could get to the point where I think it's kind of it's 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 closing in on on the chance on the potential I think because working hard on something on being able to know what transcend what helped me transcend is obviously the comparison I'm using so right if I can find a piece that I try and create that can do that, great. And whether it works for other people, it's, it's very difficult to tell because sometimes you just knock something off real quick and mm. and it's right and people really, it's affected them. You know, in the Dragons, the, you know, in the first Dragons movie, the, you know, the, the little piece with the marimbas and stuff like that, mm. that was very hard to do because... I didn't really want to do it and I knew the scene worked incredibly well and it, had, it was very difficult to do. But I don't have a great fondness for the piece, but people really like that. Right. But I do. I would say that the reason they like it is because they saw the film. I mean, you know, it's it's such a brilliant piece of filmmaking <laughs> that when you, you can attach a really shitty piece of music to, and a lot of people have careers because they've attached shitty music to mm. brilliant filmmaking. Yeah. I've, I have a great difficulty to realise that you know people enjoy it other than you know it's it's obviously it's very it's a great it's a great feeling you know but it the danger is it pricks my mm. hubris again yeah. it's like what worries me is that I don't want to stop I don't want to stop and think oh, I'm a fucking genius I mean, <laughs> I've, you know, I've written all this music and everybody loves it it's great I'm a fucking genius I don't have to do it anymore I, I've never I've never felt like that because I've always I've always compared. So I, and then I'd recommend lots of other filmmakers do that. The film the music, uh, you know, film composers do that because I can tell you guys, you know, your music's a bit shit sometimes. So <laughs> why don't you actually listen to some really good stuff? Do a bit of a comparison and then see where you are, and so maybe you'll get better at it. No, I mean, that's my theory, and I want to pursue that because I think that's the right way to right. do this. You know, I've been given a a very a very lucky life. Right. So why not actually do that? Yeah. You know, work a bit harder. It's not. I'm not working down a mine. I'm not doing hard work. Right. I'm mean, not doing proper work. I'm fanning around in a studio and writing some notes. And but I. Tr so I try and take it seriously enough that it it has the possibility of obviously touching people. That's that's of course the purpose. But right. the reality, whether it does or whether it doesn't, is is something that if too heavily considered could make you a pretentious idiot. Right. Well, which I may have already just proved. <laughs> so, I think I that's know. a perfect note to end on. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. <laughs>